can you tell us a bit about your background in computer sciences what made you decide to explore machine learning and be specific to uh, machine learning for systems okay i'll tell you the whole story i'm getting excited about this one yeah those are very very good questions i mean where do we start so maybe i'll tell people a little bit about my my background and then we can talk about what work and what we did in work <laughs> i i did a an undergrad in both computer science and psychology and i was pretty you know psychology was having sort of a replication crisis um where studies were replicating and a lot of what i learned in my undergrad was like stuff freud said which is to me like not good science it's like closer to philosophy i could argue about this people will be mad but um like it's not it wasn't <laughs> rigorous right <laughs> yeah but it's or like okay i we did a lot of like reading piaget's work which is actually valid but it was a lot of studies he conducted on his own three kids right and so it's just like this is not data driven like what is the going on here so i had this dream of like i want to use machine learning to understand like psychological questions and like use machine learning as the next set of statistical tools like psychology already uses a lot of statistics to use machine learning to get better answers so that's sort of where i started but what happened is i went to my first neurips in 2015 and i just fell in love with it because i was like oh my god we're living in the future look at how cool this is ai is real this is happening like i was so excited i remember some of the papers i saw this was neurips like 2015 there was a humanoid robot that had learned to climb up on surfaces by like putting its hand on the surface and pushing itself up and then like putting its leg up and climbing up purely end to end with like no prior and that was just like the most efficient way to get a human body onto a ledge and i was like this is so cool there was um end to end memory networks which were like looked like it was doing like analogies and reasoning which it isn't but i was excited and like just you know the a bunch of results where i'm like oh my god like ai is so good things are really happening and then i just i switched i really moved away from what my advisor works on during my phd um so that was uh somewhat challenging by the time i was like writing up my thesis which i think is your question you know it was things had changed significantly and so i think it was more like trying to show the affect of computing flavor in the deep learning and deep reinforcement learning problems i was working on I interviewed for my PhD um with Roz's group at MIT with the I the following idea I wanted to make an autism prosthetic so I wanted to have Google Glass look at the images of the person you were talking to detect their facial expression and display it to you so it would say this person seems bored maybe you should stop talking right now something like this <laughs> um and I like I just found this I thought this was going to be so cool. It was much more of an HCI project. Um like, you know, the facial expression recognition was not a key focus of the project. You probably use a pre-existing tool. Um by the time I joined the lab, that was in March or something. By the time I'd actually joined Roz's lab in September, someone else had done that project. Um I think he actually started a started a company out of it. So he was at Stanford. I forget his name, I'm sorry. Um but so that exists. the autism prosthetic google glass thing although i guess now that google glass doesn't exist anymore i don't know what happened but that was the that was the idea <laughs> enough i mean it wasn't easy for you to make the transition so can you talk about how was your journey into getting started into machine learning on your own uh what were some of the things that really worked the best for you or some things that didn't really work uh, nice enough how the internet might might say the otherwise yeah those are very very good questions i mean where do we start so maybe i'll tell people a little bit about my my background and then we can talk about what work and what we did in work so uh like you described i started out uh, in economics mainly because i loved economics i grew up in africa so economics was one of the most technical fields that i could see on day to day a lot of the people that i saw that were technical were from the world bank or the imf and i thought this is a very interesting way to model the world so a lot of the reasons why i fell in love with economics and i wanted to be an economist for the world bank were because i wanted to be able to quantify the world around me So after I graduated my undergraduate degree was in economics I actually came out to work uh in uh economic consulting in particular for antitrust cases uh for uh, the FDA and the FTC um and this is almost like a dream for an economist because you get experience working on real world cases and you use economics but at the same time uh what was interesting is I was spending my weekends volunteering so I started a nonprofit and I was working with nonprofits 
from where I'd grown up. So from areas of the world I'd grown up in, in Africa. Um, and what was, there were two things that happened. One is that uh, economic tools favor statistics, as you described. So the t models tend to be simple, uh, linear regression models, and you tend to impose a lot of assumptions about the distribution of the data. The tricky thing is, is that with real world data, often you have to make so many assumptions to make it work for the linear model that the model just strains. It, it doesn't end up being a good reflection of what new data you'll encounter. So one of the first things that happened is I started realizing there were more complex ways of modeling the world that were very fun. Um, and that was the first turning point. And after I realized that, I just wanted to learn more. Um, and I also wanted to have more control end to end because I didn't want to just be doing the algorithm phase. I wanted to be doing the end to end deployment. So that's when I joined Udemy. Uh, and I consider that to be a really, really amazing chapter in my career because I joined Udemy when it was a startup. So I was part of, uh, and it still is, but it's larger now. And Udemy at the time uh, was just over, I think it was like 140 people, but uh, the data team was very small. So the data team, I was part of the, the first people on the data team. And the modeling opportunities I had were super exciting. So that was what I would describe as the brute force stage of my career, where a lot of days I would be studying coding before, uh, working all day, and then going to uh, night classes in coding. Um, and uh, I, I think that after um, being at Udemy for two years, I realized I had learned so much I wanted to teach. So I paired it with teaching. So I was teaching machine learning. And that's when uh, I actually relocated to Kenya to teach machine learning. Um, and then uh, at that point, I got an offer from Google to join the brain residency program, which was also very unusual at the time, this whole brain residency. I was part of the second cohort. Um, and, and at the time, I thought this is a very interesting opportunity to try research because I had worked on all these applied problems. So um, I think in many ways, even though my journey seems like a zigzag, it was always motivated by problems that I was curious about. And also it was always motivated by a desire to model the world with data. So even from economics to what I do now, the underlying mechanism and question is still the same. It's more that the tools have changed. <laughs> um, and and that's what, what has really changed. And also the degree of end-to-end -end control of the tooling has changed because when you're doing research, you do a lot of large-scale experiments and you're much more technically deep. Um, so uh, machine learning, as uh, you and uh, I, your audience know, is like a very uh, popular and interesting field. And I think one of the reason, the main reason for that is an ex it's because it's an extremely powerful tool uh, that we can use and we can be built on top of to solve problems in any field, basically, that, that we want to. So uh, that, that aspect of machine learning is very exciting. Uh, for me, and the reason I focused on the systems part of, uh, and, uh, is that for a long time, there were a lot of innovation in machine learning and in neural network itself on the uh, algorithmic side, but uh, it was really, uh, like at least a major uh, contributor to the rise of AI uh, and uh, deep learning was the invention or creation of very powerful systems and chips that enable these uh, learning algorithms to run on large data set, to learn from large data set, and uh, to uh, like really push forward the progress of AI. Um, and so the way I think about it is time to return the favor and use machine learning uh, to build better systems and chips to kind of like close the loop and make sure that this progress continues. Yeah. And so this comes back to a question of like, what kind of impact do you want to have with your work? Because actually, like my original affective computing work, we did a lot of work on better models to predict um, happiness and health and stress in people, given their like everyday data from their smartphone or their wrist worn sensor and stuff like that. And there was actually like a startup interested in following up on our work and like deploying it. So in a sense, that's like closer to 
to being deployed and touching a real human. And so I think that, in a sense, is pretty meaningful. Now the stuff I'm doing, it's like little dots running around in a grid world. <laughs> like, when is this going to be useful, right? But yeah. maybe there's something about like trying to go upstream. Like if you if you invent something that uh, a lot of other people end up using in various ways, then maybe that's not that I'm doing that, but you know, <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is one thing that I, I really agree to that. But when, on the other hand, when I'm dealing with these data sets, I'm getting MRI scans from doctors. And when I show them results, I'm actually talking to radiologists and chairs yeah. of uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's associations. So it really feels when, when they say that, yeah, this is this is something that we didn't see before. And it, it feels good, even though I'm just a first year PhD student. I don't know how the rest of my four years are going to go. But it definitely feels good at the end of a uh, weekend that, hey, I at least impressed a doctor who didn't know. Like after out of his 30 years of uh, practice, he saw something that I did in like maybe three months. So I don't know if he's being modest or if he's really happy with his results so yeah uh, i do agree um uh, i think and, that's and very meaningful like good for you and i think that's so cool you know <laughs> you, you're actually doing something that could help people in the real world i mean that must feel good <laughs>